Sir, Suryodaya Basak has also joined. Hmm. Suryo, turn off, turn off your video. Maybe you can start your presentation. So it's almost one minute now. Yes, Suryo, that would be good. OK. So Suryo is saying that if he, his microphone is not worrying. OK, you, OK, fine. I think there are 25 people already, so we can start, right? OK, sir. Yeah. So you can start the first slide of your presentation. I'll give the introduction by then. OK. So I'll just probably I'm switching off my video, OK? Yeah, so, sure, sir. I request the participants to mute themselves. Uh, as Sir has already uh, informed, he'll be taking the questions after the session, but you can post your questions in the chat. OK. Good evening, everyone. I am Madhu N. I welcome you all for session two of the webinar series on industry and research perspective on data science. Today with us, we have Dr. Sehanshu Saha, who will be delivering the talk on Ada Swarm in search of super optimizer. Before we start, it's my privilege to introduce you for about today's uh, speaker. Dr. Sehanshu Saha holds his master's degree in mathematical and computational science at Clemson University and PhD from Department of Applied Mathematics at U University of Texas at Arlington in 2008. He was the recipient of prestigious Dean's Fellowship during his PhD. After working briefly at his, at his alma mater, Sehanshu moved to the University of Texas, El Paso, as a regular full-time faculty in the Department of Mathematical Sciences. He is an associate professor of CS and IS and Anuradha and Prashant Palikruti Center for Artificial Intelligence Research. Bits Pilani, 
Birla Goa campus and heads the Center for Astro Info Informatics Modeling and Simulation. He is also a visiting professor at the Department of Statistics, University of Georgia, USA. He has published 90 peer reviewed articles in the International Journal and conferences. Dr. Saha is an IEEE senior member, ACM senior member, vice chair, International Astrostatics Association, and former chair, IEEE Computer Society Bangalore chapter. Dr. Saha is the editor of Journal of Scientometric uh, Research, a peer reviewed CSI Scopus Index Journal. He is an associate fellow of the Inter University Consortium of Astronomy and Astrophysics and a fellow of IETE. Dr. Saha received the Distinguished Research Researcher Award, Peace in the Astro. Astroinformatics and Machine Learning in 2019. Seanshu's current and future research interests lie in data science, theory of machine learning, and astronomy. I welcome you, sir. It's a pleasure for us to have you as a speaker for today's session. And I would like you to take over the session, sir. OK. Thank you so much, Professor Madhu. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Am I audible? Yes, sir. OK. All right. Uh, are my slides visible? Uh, not yet, sir. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet, sir. Okay. Yes, I am already on the full screen mode. Uh, no, okay. no. I think you have to sh click the present now. Uh, present okay. now button. All right. All right. How about now? Yes, sir. It's coming now. It is visible. OK. okay. All right. Thank you so much. So uh, before I begin, I think probably it's better that we switch off our um, audio. And uh, while I give a talk, uh, it's probably a good idea to hold your question. But I mean, I encourage you to you know simultaneously type in your questions in the chat box so that by the time I'm finished, um, I could actually uh, read through all of your questions one by one and answer each one of them to the best of my ability. OK? All right. Uh, excuse me, just one minute. For some strange region, reason, I am not able to see the slides. I mean, uh, is, are the slides visible to everybody? Because I am not able to see the slides. Yes, ma'am, it's visible to us. Yes, yeah, actually, you, you, you should mute your mic. Yes, I will. But uh, now I am able to. OK, sure. OK, thank you so much. Yeah, bye -bye. Yeah. All right, let's begin. OK? Uh, so uh, my, my talk today um, is about uh, a super optimizer, let's say. And it's, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you why um, I intend to call this a super optimizer. As uh, Professor Madhu has introduced, you know that my interests lie in machine learning and particularly in the computational learning theory. Okay, and uh, I I try to look between connections in different aspects of theoretical and computational machine learning, and try to connect methods which are apparently sort of parallel to each other, not entirely orthogonal, but parallel to each other, and generally follow different tracks. So, um, what I mean by that is that when we talk about uh, some kind of a swarm or some kind of a meta heuristic optimization we tend to solve a different class of problems, okay? And when we talk about, uh, you know, optimization in the traditional classical sense of machine learning, we tend to solve a different class of problems, which are classification, okay? So there are these apparently two different class of problems. One is you, I give you a bunch of different functions, whether a function is a single objective function or a multi-objective function, constrained or unconstrained, right? And you give me the maximum or minimum value of that function typically hard problems right okay so that's one kind of optimization the other kind of optimization is that you know uh, between your predicted values and the target values there is some error right and you typically model your error as a mean square error function or uh, some other sort of uh, differentiable loss function right and what you try to do is to try to minimize the difference between your target values and the predicted value because you would want your prediction to be as accurate and robust as possible, right? So 
In order to do that, so the classification problem of predicting different class levels is actually equivalent to minimizing or maximizing, I mean, minimizing a loss function or maximizing a risk function. Okay, either or whichever way you want to look at it. So that also becomes a sort of an optimization problem in a more classical sense. Okay, uh, however, I mean, strangely enough, these classical optimization problems also include some parameters that we are required to tune in order that we get to the desired minima, right? And there comes an opportunity to use some sort of a meta heuristic algorithm. Okay, so, but apparently, uh, I mean, I haven't seen much effort in the community to sort of get a bridge between a completely meta heuristic optimization, which is used to solve a different class of problem to solve this class of problems, which is classification problems in machine learning. Okay, so that's what the talk is about. I mean, as Professor Madhu has already explained, I mean, we do this as a special mandate in the Anuradha and Prashant Palakurti Center for Artificial Intelligence Research. And, and the, one of the first mandate that we have is the conceptual AI. Okay, so what we, we try to explore is if a method is working well, we try to explore why that particular method is working well. And you know, in these days, most people are heavily reliant on some machine learning and some deep learning architecture. In fact, the traditional classical statistical machine learning algorithms are not favored anymore among the majority of the community. Um, I find it <coughs> somewhat unfair, but I mean, that's the way it is because you know, the, the, the data to train, the corpus of data to train these days have become increasingly uh, large and you probably, you require some sort of a combination of classical and meta heuristic algorithms to solve these problems efficiently, okay? And most of these problems, as you know, are sort of uh, not solved on a regular CPU. I mean, your, your laptop or your desktop or even your workstation. Okay, so people are moving towards cloud, people are moving towards GPU style computing and so on and so forth. So one of the focus of this research is also to see if the cost of doing all of this computation in order to get the desired results, whether the cost could be scaled down. Okay, we know that one of the ways of scaling down the cost is to reduce the training time. Okay, I mean, typically, I mean, if I give you an example, recently there is a there is a paper that has come to news and most of these are natural language processing applications where the training itself took five days in order to train the corpus efficiently for doing a natural language processing task took five days. And some researchers at University of Virginia, I think, I'm not sure, I don't remember, they actually computed the carbon emission of the train. Okay, and it turns out that uh, the carbon emission because of that training in order to perform that machine learning classification task was equivalent to if you run six four wheelers six four wheelers six vehicles continuously for 12 hours every day for six days right that's the equivalent carbon emission that you have produced while training that method so you can imagine the cost the other kinds of cost now you you i mean people say that okay we don't care but if these are the kind of escalated cost of doing an experiment on your computer, on your machine, then I am of the firm opinion that such kind of experiments need to be abandoned. In the sense that there has to be some better ways to you know, come up with methods that require far less training time as well as resources. Okay, so this is the motivation of you know, diving into this kind of work. Okay, so the Title of the talk says, we are searching for a super optimizer, okay? And in the process of doing so, we are taking the route of a meta heuristic optimization, which is funny in the sense that meta heuristic, most meta heuristic optimizations tend to be slow, okay? All right, because they're iterative in nature, okay? However, um, the rate of slowness or the lack of speed is comparable or slightly better than the speed with which you are training your deep learning models. Okay, so that trade-off is sort of well balanced if we can figure out a way to use meta heuristic algorithms in 
sort of uh, machine learning classification problem. So overall, that's the landscape, right? Um, however, uh, there is this, there are many, many, many metaheuristic algorithms, mostly inspired from nature. It's like how certain flock of animals move, certain flock of, I mean, school of fish, flock of birds. You have probably, I mean, a flock of migratory birds is always a lovely sight. I mean, if you notice carefully that there, there, is, there is indeed some discipline in the way they fly. However, I mean, you would, if you notice long enough, you will also see that there could be some members of that flock which would fly off for a while, you know, different in a sort of different route than the rest of the flock, but then they quickly realize that they are not following the same pattern or they are not following the same trajectory as the rest of their teammates, and they quickly align themselves to the rest of the flock. Okay, so this kind of behavior is called a swarm behavior. I mean, we see this swarm behavior in humans as well, right? I mean, I mean, if there are a bunch of, I mean, uh, and uh, so it, it's sort of, uh, if I can give an example that, you know, irrational behavior is sort of in a swarm. I mean, if I see five people behaving irrationally, it's very easy to get carried away, right? And therefore you actually, online trolling is actually something like that. It also, I mean, follows the same principle, right? Okay, all right. I'm not going to get political, but anyway. So here is the deal. You know, you have one, guy flying in and then you have another bunch of guys flying in and all of these guys are in search of what? They're actually searching for something. They are not flying without purpose. In this particular case, this set of guys are actually searching for honey. Okay. All right. So probably one of these guys in the swarm knows exactly where the honeycomb is and rest of the guys follow. So this is one way of doing this. So there is one leader in the swarm or it's sort of a well-coordinated, orchestrated, or maybe a trial and error-based local and global search algorithm where you have a bunch of people searching for the same thing. And the moment one person is sort of indicating, gives out a signal, look, I'm probably closer to where we all are than everybody else moves, moves in that direction. So that's the basic principle of it. Okay. I mean, in a, in a very layman-ish term. So what we see is that there is some individual trend and then there is some group trend. And we are going to come back to this, right? Okay. So in this particular case, you can say that there is some individual velocity of one insect and then there is some group velocity of one insect. Okay. All right. So if the group velocity starts dominating, then the individual has to align with the rest of the group. That's the basic principle of it. Okay. Now, each one of these members of a flock is conveniently called as a particle, okay? And a bunch of particles together form a swarm. That is why it's called a particle swarm, okay? Typically, there are questions regarding how many particles in a swarm, I'll get to those questions later, right? And then the last word of this particular algorithm is optimization, okay? Let's not talk about optimization right away, okay? Let's talk about Sharmaji ki beti. Okay, so let's talk about Sharmaji ki beti. Now we all know that joke, right? Sharmaji ka beta, Sharmaji ki beti. Like in a neighborhood, I mean, your um, your parents keep telling you, look, I mean, you are so useless. I mean, you are in the ninth grade. You are not doing anything. You are always on the TV or in your mobile phone. Look at Sharmaji ki beti. She's doing so well in dance. She's doing so well in studies. She's making her parents proud. What have you done? Now, if there is one Sharmaji ki beti in the neighborhood, right? Okay, then you are not the only casualty of that. I mean, there are a bunch of other guys in your group who are also probably pestered on by their parents and trying, you know, sort of insisting that, okay, you also follow what Sharmaji's Betty is doing. Okay, now you can take it in two ways. One is that you get extremely pissed at Sharmaji's Betty and your parents. Okay, that's option one. Okay, but I mean, since we are all Indians, we know that, you know, as Indian kids under the way we are brought up, we usually don't have much options. So we probably sort of go to option two, where we are sort of required to find some goodness in following Sharmaji Ki Beti. In doing what? In doing some things that are socially acceptable to be good. Okay. So maybe this person has set a bar. Okay. 
So think of this as a hill climbing problem, right? So think of Sharma ji ki beti at the top of a hill, right? And we guys are lesser mortals. We are all at the downhill, or we are probably at the valley. And our parents, or maybe us, we, our, our, we ourselves are sort of inspired to take on that route, climb the hill, and follow Sharma ji ki beti. Okay. Now, when I'm talking about a hill kind climbing problem, you see if it's a if there is a hill and there is a valley, right? So there is a maximum height that somebody has attained, right? What you guys are trying to do, or what we guys are trying to do, we guys are trying to search for that height ourselves, and we are also trying to reach that peak. Now, in a cooperative setting where all the particles are cooperating with each other and communicating with each other, in this case, I would imagine, or you could imagine, Sharma ji's Betty as an inspiration, and she's a really nice person, inspiring and helping her peers to get up to speed. So, this is a cooperative problem where every member of the population is trying to search for something. And what is it that they are trying to search? They are trying to search for a Optima or a maximum. They're trying to search for a peak. Okay. All right. Now, Sharma Ji Ki Beti is my favorite example. I use, I keep on using this, uh, this example in multiple different methods in machine learning that I teach. Okay. Um, and there is another example that I cannot help talk about. And whenever I can, I will bring this up, which is uh, you see a fish, right? This is some pond, right? Some lake or whatever, right? A water body, and you see a fish. Okay, you know where I come from. Okay, I every every opportunity that I get, I'll talk about fish. Okay, all right. So because I love fish, I love eating fish, I love catching fish. Okay, because these days I, you know, we, we, you know, there is a, there isn't an opportunity. But let's let's look at this problem from another angle. So the one example that I gave you is a hill climbing example. So that means from a bottom, somewhere in the bottom, you are trying to climb up. Okay, all right. Let's look at this, flip this problem. And so, so, so the first example that I gave you is an example where we are searching for the maxima. Okay, now this is an example where we will be searching for a minima because usually where is this particular fish? As you can see, it is lying at the bottom of the lake. Right, so in this case, where would our, how would our search algorithm terminate? Our search algorithm will terminate by scouring through the depths of the lake. And as you can see from the figure itself, the depth is not uniform, right? It's of different depths in different places, right? So we have to keep digging, right? I mean, digging in the sense, not literally digging. We have to keep measuring the height of the lake, right? Okay. And see, get to the bottom of the lake. And if we get to the bottom of the lake, we would be able to catch the fish. So this is a minimization problem, okay? Because what we are actually at the surface of the lake in a boat or something, right? Okay. So let's look at this. Now we can do this alone, right? I mean, I, I'm just the lone guy doing this alone and this will be a test of patience, right? Because I mean, I have a fishing rod and all that stuff, right? And I keep on, keep waiting till the fishing rod actually reaches to the bottom, is able to, you know, entice the fish out of its way, blah, blah, blah. However, if I think of this as instead of me alone searching for the fish, I have a friend, okay? All right, whose goal is also the same as mine, okay? So you can, any of the two positions, one is me and the other one is my friend. Okay, we both are looking for that fish in the bottom of the lake. Okay, so how do we start solving this problem? This is also a search problem, right? We are searching for the optima. In this case, the optima is at the minima. Okay, so what we should do is that we should have some, you know, mode of communication that is available at our disposal. So I keep, we keep calling out the other person, right? Okay. So what happens is we, we start at two random positions, okay? And we measure the depth of the leg. By the way, we actually do not know the depth of the leg a priori in different locations. So we have to keep searching, right? So in some position, my friend is telling, look, my depth is three meters. And then I also measure the depth. I say, look, my depth is uh, 2.5 meters, okay? 
since the problem is to get to the deepest end of the leg, right? I should actually follow the path where it leads me to that deep end of the leg. Okay, all right. So in that sense, I need to trust on what my friend is telling me. So if my friend is telling me that he or she is at a greater depth than I am, then what I should do? I should actually move towards my friend. Okay, all right. And I need to keep doing this. Now, so what I have shown you earlier, um, sorry, what I have shown you earlier was the initial position of two particles. Okay, all right. And what I'm showing you now is that the position of the two particles after a one time step. Okay, because this is a temporal exercise, right? It requires time. After one time step. So after one time step, what we do, we measure the depth again, we communicate again. In this case, whomsoever depth is measured to be greater, the other person moves in that direction. Okay, it could change any time, mind you based on the geometry of the leg, how the, how the depths are scattered over and so on and so forth. But however, the hope is we do this enough number of times, okay? And after some time, the second guy converges to the position of the first guy. And the reason why the second guy converges to the position of the first guy is because both guys agree that the depth that they have now measured after a set of iterations in time is the largest depth and it cannot be improved. So from a computational point of view, what we can do is we can set a total number of tries. I mean, this is the, these are the number of tries, this many number of tries I should do before I stop. Okay, all right. Or this is the number of resources that I need. So if two guys are not enough, I can actually call my whole community, my whole mahalla my whole para, right? And I call them. And so instead of two guys, I can employ 50 guys. Okay. And each one measuring the depth. Okay. All right. So that would probably be faster than two guys, hopefully. Right. Okay. So at any point of time, the moment some guy found the optima or the minima in this case, the search process stops. So at this point of time, if I have to summarize this process, what is this? This is basically a search. So you may search locally and globally as well. Okay, right. Now, if if I draw the lake, you know, you know, in a much more expandable version, and where I have actually multiple low points in the lake, then it's a question of whether the minima I think I have reached is really the minima or the lowest point, or am I stuck in a sort of a local minima? But these are some sort of classical questions that we ask when we solve a machine learning classification problem in gradient descent or gradient ascent, right? Okay. So the way it is, is that I'm trying to solve an optimization problem by searching through a space. The space is usually a continuous space, which is why sometimes this search process could be painstakingly slow, right? But if I have set my parameters wisely and this wisely you should take this word wisely with a pinch of salt because the parameter settings are sort of the universal parameter settings that people use in a particle swarm optimization algorithm is after many, many, many years of experimentation and empirical studies that people have agreed to a basic parameter setting of particle swarm optimization, which I'm going to talk about later. Okay. All right. At this point of time, I think I should also tell you that I don't like this method. Okay, I, I really don't like this method of optimizing a function or a set of functions using meta heuristics. In general, I have a, I have a dislike for meta heuristics in general, right? But over the years, I have also realized that instead of using meta heuristics as a vanilla black box algorithm, you could perhaps use the meta heuristic is somewhere else. That is exactly, you know, the latter part of the talk is about. Okay. So if I summarize that each particle in your swarm is searching for an optima, each particle has a velocity. So each particle has an individual velocity, right? And each particle 
also has an individual velocity and each particle also could have a particle best and particle best is something that okay if i try alone this is the best that i could do i cannot surpass this this is my bar okay so there is an individual best and then there is a global best you actually look for the global best because the moment you have attained the global best you know that your search process probably terminates and you have found either the minima or the maxima depending on the kind of problems that you are solving whether it's a hill climbing problem or whether it's like a, a you know catching fish problem in a lake okay there is also some memory attached associated with each particle's position because it could so happen that if i am moving too fast i could probably miss the optima that i am looking for i may overshoot it right so therefore each and every position of mine i need to keep that in my memory okay so that when i know i have overshot okay i could actually come back to it okay so therefore there is a memory of the position okay however this is not very very computationally expensive okay but that if you think about this as i said i mean imagine i am the only person looking for that fish in that lake it could take me all day and without much success so therefore there has to be some cooperative setting that needs to come in in order that my success rate has a higher probability okay all right so which is why the idea of a swarm comes into place okay so every particle has a neighborhood if you have a flock size of 50 right i mean you can imagine have you seen wolves i mean let me ask you i mean have you seen a, how wolves move a wolf colony you have seen that you know there are some guys at the front there are some guys at the back and then there are some guys at the you know very tail end of that population okay they move in a certain manner all right so depending on how the colony is or how the animal behavior is in the case of wolves the leader is actually at the back okay and there are more there is more than one leader as a matter of fact okay so anyway but when a flock of birds moving the guy the bird which is at the tail end of the flock has actually no way of seeing what the first guy is doing right because i mean he, he, i mean its vision is probably impaired so what it will do is it will see how its neighbors are doing so there is a neighborhood search while you are moving and then there is a global search so remember this it's a very very simple cooperation it moves from a local search to a global search okay and each particle knows its position each particle also knows the position and the velocity of its neighboring particle right and that's how they measure the fitness of those who are in the neighborhood okay and the fitness is nothing but the optimal value that you are going to get now what am i going to do if you know uh, if i know my neighborhoods my neighbors fitness is that i will try to improve my own fitness so that i can align with itself so my neighbors fitness helps me to do what adjust my velocity okay all right so this is a small animation so I think this is self-explanatory that you know there are some positions and velocities which are initialized. And one second, you can see that this is a hill climbing problem. You can see two peaks at the hill, right? This is a hard problem. You can also see there is somewhat another peak. It's a third peak also, right? But imagine you are moving from the left of that lower peak, and you have reached the peak, and you have satisfied itself. Oh, I have reached the peak. That's not true, right? because that sort of a local maxima in this particular case that you need to avoid i mean you can get to that peak and then you need to climb down right and you need to climb down and actually reach the highest peak so the middle one is actually the highest peak the two adjacent ones are also peaks but their heights are not as as great as the middle one right so therefore from a neighborhood local search you need to move towards the global search so there has to be communication between all the particles however the communication happens in a sort of a clustered manner okay all right so if i have to talk about a model at this point of time so we have 
sort of laid down nice story, right? I mean, how particles behave, how a swarm behaves, and so on and so forth, right? So, how am I going to get this to something which is workable? I mean, how do I make this work? Okay. So, as I said earlier, that the particle has to adjust its velocity, right? How is it going to adjust its velocity? See, the particle already has a current velocity, right? Okay, and therefore, um, but the current velocity may not be good enough. So, the particle needs to do this with its current velocity. It has to be a random search in the direction of its personal best. However, that personal best itself, your personal best, may not fetch you the goal or the objective that you are trying to figure out, right? So you have to look for your neighbors, right? Okay. So there has to be a neighborhood best, okay? So there has to be a random position towards your personal best, and there has to be a randomized search for the best position towards your neighbors. So these three components together will actually give you a new updated velocity for the particle, okay? All right. So let's see. Um, I think I can skip this. So there is a geophysical, um, it is sort of says the same thing, right? Uh, so the, there are some techniques of fixing neighborhood. Some you can use a three neighborhood, which means you, you and two other particles in your neighborhood, and you can use a five neighborhood particle or so on and so forth, right? Okay. So anyway, so there is a, so by at this point of time, you know, I mean, you, probably realize that there is a social component and there is a cognitive component. Okay. All right. So the cognitive component is how you adjust your present velocity in a towards your personal best. That's the cognitive part because you know, I mean, when you are an individual, you know something about yourself. You know that this may not be my best. I probably can do better. Right. I mean, you, you probably have this feeling somewhere in your, I mean, at some point in your life, right? So that is the cognitive ability to, you know, adjust your own performance, right? However, your cognitive ability will not get you towards solving the problem that you are looking for to solve, right? So what you need to do is you need to learn from your neighbors or as a matter of fact, you need to learn from your society. So that's a social component that you need to imbibe, okay? All right. So this social component comes from the geographical, overall geographical position that you yourself are in. Okay. All right. So it could be actually from a particle which is far, far away from you. Okay. And that particle is actually probably the one which gives you the global best position. Okay. And the entire geography, the entire topology of your search space combined with your cognitive abilities will lead you towards solving this particular problem. So, so far, please remember guys, that I am only talking about an optimization problem. I'm only talking about how I can use a bunch of particles to solve an optimization problem, which means given a function or a set of functions, can I find its minima and maxima? Okay, all right. You may also wonder, why do I need this particular method? I can simply use calculus. No, you cannot. You cannot. I mean, calculus problems, I mean, the problems which are, uh, which you can solve by using calculus are sort of, you know, simpler problems where you do not encounter this multiple peaks or multiple valleys. Okay. All right. So the moment you encounter the multiple peaks or multiple value problem, most of your calculus best methods fail or pain, are painstakingly slow to converge to your solution. Okay. All right. So what is my personal best? The be This is actually put eloquently and I'm quoting from uh, Ebenhardt, one of the two guys who actually came up with this particle swarm optimization algorithm. And interestingly, he was a social scientist. And there was this other guy who was an electrical engineer. So imagine, I mean, when in, in our country, when governments are, you know, increasingly and all governments, not only any government, Governments are questioning the existence of social science programs in our universities. Here is one algorithm right in front of you, which is one of the, I would reckon, one of the brilliant algorithms of our times, okay, which is actually a joint effort between a social scientist and an electrical engineer. Okay. All right. 
So what is my personal best? My personal best is nothing but a compromise between what I am comfortable with and what society thinks I should be comfortable with. So see, if you, uh, I mean, for example, when I was a kid, right? I mean, when I was in sixth standard, I actually wanted to be a truck driver. I'm not kidding. I wanted to drive trucks when I grew up, okay? Actually, the moment I broke this to my parents and more importantly to my neighbors and my well-wishers and my relatives, they were in shock. I mean, how can somebody in sixth grade uh, think of being a truck driver? Okay, so what I wanted to, what I, what I considered my personal best at that point of time was not good enough for anyone else around me. So you have to then, you know, you know, tune yourself when you think of, okay, and then I wanted to be a chef, which was again, once again a shock to my parents and, and my relatives and so on and so forth, right? So what I had to do, I mean, I could not become a chef. I could not become, I, I, I actually at a point of time, I was a very good badminton player. I'm bragging a little bit. I could not become a sportsman. I could not become a chef. What did I become? I actually became a third rate computer scientist. Okay, I mean, that is something, you know, the society thought I, I, I should be doing, right? Okay, and these kind of compromises we all make, right? We, you know that. Anyway, now this is very, very important. This is sort of, you think about this, you think about the initial position of a particle or my position or your position, right? Okay. Now there is a global best somewhere, okay? And then there is a personal best somewhere. Now, what I can do is, without regard to anybody, uh, without caring what others think, I can move in an arbitrary direction with some velocity. You can see that vector with a solid line V, right? Okay. However, as I just gave you an example, it's not good enough to the direction I was going, which is to become a truck driver or a chef, right? What I am, what I have become is, I initially move in this direction, but then there is some with my you know cognitive abilities i recall that i could probably do better and that better is in aligned in some other direction okay i'm so these arrowed lines represent a line segment with a direction which means these are all vectors okay so i need to adjust myself but eventually my adjustment should be towards the global best and i cannot do this in one shot right so what should be next what should i do next I should actually move in a direction towards my personal best. Now, where I am, the green line that you can see, I cannot really jump, right? So what I can do is I can actually, this is my personal best. I can do, what I can do is to move in a position which is, or move in a direction which is parallel to that vector, okay? Which is exactly what the second green line does. Well, my personal best may not be good enough, right? So what I should do, I need to readjust. How do I readjust? I have to move again in a direction which is aligned to the direction of the global best. Okay, this is where my global best is. So what do I do? If I'm not moving, somebody will kick me in my back and you know force me to move in that direction. So I move in this direction, okay? Bingo. So if I'm moving in the direction of global best and I know when I know that I have reached my global best, I'll stop, okay? However, it does not really happen by magic. So once again, I'll just retrace the path. Sorry, I'll retrace the path, okay? Now let me, when you are moving in a direction parallel to your personal best, what you must do from the very basics of vector algebra is that you need to multiply the difference between your PI, which is your personal best and your current position X. So there is this difference. The length of this line segment is PI minus X. You are moving in a direction parallel to this line, right? So what you need to do, you need to multiply this by a scalar. Okay, remember this. So you need to multiply this with a scalar. So that is exactly what you are doing, right? And then you are again moving in the direction of global velocity. So in this case, there is a difference between your global best and your present position. 
and that difference is computed by the difference between pg and x once again you need to multiply that with another scalar okay so these are by scalar i mean a number so these are numbers actually when we employ and since this is sort of random right i mean your initial your personal best and the global best both are actually at random locations not known a priori to you right so these scalars or the coefficients that you are multiplying with right these are drawn from a random distribution and then what kind of distribution are these that drawn from these are drawn from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1 okay so that is the first parameter in question that we need to think of okay and if i do all of that i actually come to the first two lines which is which forms the crux of the particle swarm optimization algorithm is that first you look at the second equation the second equation is basically the updated velocity okay the updated velocity is nothing but your current velocity plus some random number times p based minus p you can replace p with x right okay so this is what this is the difference between your personal best and your current position and since you are moving in a direction parallel to this vector you multiply it with some random number right the same thing happens between your personal best and your global best because your personal best may not be good enough so that difference you multiply again with a scalar so that you can move in the direction of your global best okay and then the c1 and c2 are nothing but acceleration coefficients okay similarly you can actually include another coefficient in front of the velocity on the right hand side and that is called an inertia so that is an inertia coefficient is basically tells you that okay i mean i need this particular push so that i move from my initial position well i can do nothing right i can simply sit in my particular position and i'll be happy with it so i need some push to move in a random direction with some velocity right so that acceleration the inertia coefficient gives me that push once i have updated and recomputed my new velocity in the next time step i go back and update what update my position okay all right and that's how i am going to search okay all right so this is a more indexed representation of the same particle swarm algorithm okay the reason why you see a subscript i is that i have a bunch of particles right so i i denote each particle with i right in sort of an array it's a column vector and you can replace i with 1 2 3 4 and that will say that you know this is the velocity of this particular particle like second particle third particle fourth particle so on and so forth and you see a sub superscript right this superscript is actually a time step because your position and velocity are changing as time changes right okay is an iterative algorithm okay i mean in data structures and also in advanced algorithms i mean just basic algorithms course you have studied different kinds of algorithms so one of that kind is an iterative algorithm right okay all right so the way iterative algorithms work is very simple you keep iterating until the difference between two successive iterates is less than or equal to a tolerance that you have set and that tolerance could be anything that tolerance could be an error tolerance that tolerance could be also the maximum number of iterations and so on okay all right so don't worry about the pseudo code because at the end of my slide i will i will show you the github repository where you can go and visit and download the code and test for yourself right so don't don't worry and there are some certain other parameter tunings that are also required however uh, sorry one minute so you need to initialize the number of particles so typically the number of particles are kept between anywhere from 20 to 50 no real reason why as i said i've been many many years of uh, experimentation and struggle uh, people have decided that this is an optimal you know population of your swarm the c1 and c2 which are the acceleration coefficients as i mentioned the sum of c1 and c2 has also been observed that it gives us the best results when the sum of c1 and c2 is equal to 4 okay and also there is a limit on the velocity you cannot let your velocity be infinite so that it always escapes your you know minima or the maxima all the time so you have got to clamp your velocity okay so but these are some some of the uh, you know parameter tuning restrictions that people employ so that they can solve 
some optimization problems. Okay, I'm not going to bother about this. However, this is an important part if you want to restrict yourself to solving a very specific class of problems only. Okay, this is one of the reasons why I used to hate this particular algorithm. I never, never liked this until we discovered something else. Okay, I mean, this I have already talked about. Okay, so don't worry. So see, see, these are some of the some of the functions, real life functions that people deal with, and your standard calculus based techniques are actually unable to find the minima or the maxima. You, you can look at any of these functions, and you can see how complicated and weird these functions are. I mean, you, it's possible that you are actually stuck in a valley. It's possible that you are actually stuck. In, in a, one of the peaks, one of the peaks, one of the mini peaks of your hill, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, but it has been found that particle swarm optimization algorithms efficiently solve these problems. Okay, much, much, much more faster than the traditional, uh, you know, gradient ascent or gradient descent rules. Okay, and these are some of the results. Don't worry about this. Okay, um, also, this is another parameter tuning effort which I'm not going to worry about. I have actually kept everything in one slide so that it's, it's sort of becomes a self-contained study. And my intention is not to talk about how you tune the parameters to solve a problem. Okay, that's not what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so I'm just going to skip slides. Okay, now I'm going to come to the most important part of my talk, which is, is this why I wanted to talk about particle swarm optimization? That you could actually solve some problems uh, just finding the minima or maxima of functions? No. I mean, my intention was completely different. My intention is this. My intention is that, look, we solve these problems in machine learning and deep learning, and there are some notoriously hard and you know weird data sets, right? I mean, some, some in computer vision and some other ways, right? But the training time is excessively long. So I want to reduce the training time. How do I reduce my training time? I want to reduce my training time by improvising on the standard gradient descent or ascent algorithms that I employ. How do I do that? You know, in a, in a, in a general neural network setting, you have an input layer, you have an output layer, you have one hidden layer in between, right? You set some activation function, you fire the uh, activation function, beyond the threshold it fires and it goes to the hidden layer from the hidden layer it goes to the output layer and from the output layer you generate the uh, your output level right if your output level matches with your target level right then you say that the prediction is fine there is nothing else to do but most of the times it doesn't most of the times there is a difference between what you have predicted and what you, what is the actual class level of the target class right so therefore you made an error where did you make an error why did you make an error? Very, very likely you have chosen the wrong weights to initialize. So this is a fully connected neural network, right? Where every neuron in the input layer is connected to every neuron in the hidden layer and, and simultaneously concurrently. Similarly, every neuron in the hidden layer is connected to every neuron in the output layer, right? And so when you connect these neurons across layers, you use some random weight combinations. This is another meta heuristic, right? And very, very likely, the reason why you have made a mess of your prediction is because you have chosen a wrong initial weights. So what do you do? You have to back propagate your error. So you made an error. So this is like one forward pass. Now you come in the backward pass, you back propagate your error. And what you hope to achieve is that you update the error. Okay, you update the error and then reinitialize it and do this process over and over again, back and forth, back and forth, like a swing. Right? Until you minimize the error between your target class and the predicted class. So there is a loss function that sits in. Okay? And typically this loss function could be a squared loss function. This loss function could be some cross entropy loss function or some of the more interesting loss functions which are actually non-differentiable. And, and that's the reason why most people don't use it in neural network training is a mean absolute error loss function or check loss or a quantile loss. Okay? So how am I going to use particle swarm optimization in order to minimize this error? Okay, so that is the question that I was having for a very, very long time. 
you know i have already qualified myself as a third grade computer scientist so it really took me some time to figure this out and just you know pay attention to my next 90 seconds of rant i'm basically ranting right because i have to tell you how great my work is so my inspiration for particle swarm comes from a totally different source and this source of inspiration to understand and improve optimization techniques in general and particle swarm optimization in particular can come from many many places right because it the particle swarm optimization gives you some nice perspective perspectives in dynamical systems at play right okay however uh there are guys who have shown earlier that in a stochastic gradient descent optimization technique can turn turned into a sampling technique by just adding some noise governed by some langevian dynamics don't worry about it right and then there is another set of guys who said that you know there is there should be some connection between the two right there should be some connection between an underlying dynamical system governed by some stochastic differential equations okay and so these stochastic differential equations are approximated so the point is i'm trying to make is that instead of computing the gradient so so in the in the back propagation when you have made an error right in your neural network prediction in the back propagation you are computing error gradients which are error gradients error rate of change of your error with respect to every weight combination that you have used okay now this is a very very expensive computation and needs to be done a lot of times and many of the times when your loss function itself the error function itself is non differentiable you cannot compute this partial derivatives at all so what is the alternative the alternative is very very convenient people don't use non differentiable loss functions at all which is again i recall is something that we should not be doing we actually should be because the mean absolute error is a much more robust loss function compared to mean square error okay all right for the simple reason your mean absolute error is 0.9 i'm giving you an example your mean absolute error is 0.9 what is your mean square error when you are squaring it up when you are squaring it up it becomes 0.81 so when you are using your mean square error as a metric to figure out how good is your machine learning prediction algorithm you are actually misrepresenting so your mean absolute error always makes you look bad okay so but you know people don't use mean absolute error in neural neural network training because there are lots of challenges so this particle swarm optimization we strongly believe will help us overcome these challenges by doing what by providing an alternative to gradient computation mean absolute error or any sort of non differentiable loss function cannot be differentiated right so what i do okay so what i do is is there some explainability of using the loss function can we approximate the derivative how can we approximate the derivative well it turns out that five six theorems later i don't have the time to you know explain to you the theorem and the proofs i'll nonetheless show you the theorems so through this set of theorems that we have proved we have proved that that there is an equivalent expression between the derivative of a function that is where we started actually we started from the absolute loss uh, you know in a absolute function y is equal to absolute value of x that is non differentiable if you think about it just visualize it it has a singularity at zero right so we used a theorem to show that near the singularity you can fix a neighborhood where it is still differentiable and you expand the taylor series in the neighborhood instead of at that particular point and if you do that you can actually come up with an alternate expression of the derivative of the function in terms of the parameters of the particle swarm optimization get that that is what interest me in pso nothing else the ability of pso to solve pure engineering optimization problems do not interest me the ability of pso to come up with an alternative for a derivative interest me however this is not good enough i mean i am i am i am able to approximate a derivative so what my intention is to apply it in different neural network and deep learning techniques right so the second step in that sequence of thought is 
a gradient descent or a gradient ascent algorithm that you employ in a vanilla neural network right so instead of using the error gradient in a gradient descent algorithm i once again we extended this derivative approximation proof to gradient descent to stochastic gradient descent now stochastic gradient descent is an improvement over gradient descent to solve certain nasty problems in optimization i mean the difference between gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent is gradient descent assumes that you are sort of descending or ascending across a smooth loss function the stochastic gradient descent says that if your loss function is sort of jagged and looks like one of those functions that i have shown you a few slides earlier then i actually move my gradient in a random direction instead in a being a smooth fashion however whether you use a gradient descent or a stochastic gradient descent in both cases instead of computing the gradient or the derivative we use an approximation in terms of the particle swarm optimization parameter and finally over a really deep learning network like a resnet 50 which has 50 hidden layers whether you can use this across and come up with an alternative okay turns out we have done exactly all of this all of this so a bunch of theorems okay all right i'm going to skip this i'm going to skip all of this i mean this is this is for you to read okay uh um, i have said all of this and before that however let me also tell you that i mean uh, the standard variant of the particle swarm optimization uh was we were not able to prove this equivalence using the standard variants of the standard particle swarm optimization so we proposed an improvement over the particle swarm optimization which is unlike the vanilla particle swarm optimization method we used a exponentially averaged momentum component in the to update the velocity okay and this momentum component also comes from the idea of neural networks and what really happens is um these these momentums of all the particles at t plus 1 position at the at a time step t plus 1 can be expressed in terms of momentums and velocities of the particles at all previous positions which is a departure from the standard particle swarm optimization algorithm if you look at standard particle swarm optimization algorithm on the left you have t plus 1 and on the right you have just t so it's just a one step process what really happens in our method is that if you do the math forget all of this if you do the math you will see an expression of momentum okay in terms of all the previous momentums okay and the way it works is that this beta is a coefficient between 0 and 1 which we call as the momentum coefficient if you notice carefully the first term the first term on the right hand side is the closest in terms of the time step of your iterative process to your updated momentum okay sorry it's a it's a farthest okay and that that as you go farther on the right towards this expression right i mean you will see the terms to the further right are actually terms which are closer to the current position because it is vi to the power t minus 1 vi to the power t minus 2 now notice the coefficients the coefficients are 1 minus beta and the other coefficient is beta times 1 minus beta as i told you beta is between 0 and 1 so 1 minus beta is still a number that is not small enough but come back to the right hand side of the equation and look at the first term it says beta to the power n and this n could be the number of iterations right okay so if beta is between 0 and 1 beta to the power n is sort of what a really really small number now what are these coefficients doing these coefficients actually assign the weights of your respective momentums right so the first momentum term that you see on the right hand side the first term on the right hand side the first momentum term if its coefficient is beta to the power n what it says tells us that when you actually update your momentum the really far far away momentums have little role to play towards your updated momentum that's the interpretation of it okay but i really wanted to keep everything in the memory so that you know you may shoot off the, the global minima or a global maxima and you don't know when you are going to use one of the really past 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 history okay that's why that is why i kept everything in the history while updating the momentum as well as the velocity okay so that is the departure from the standard particle swarm optimization okay however anyway once we have done this 
we actually could come up with a bunch of equivalences. So here you can see the first derivative and the second derivative, which you use in a general approximation algorithm, can be expressed in terms of the parameters of the PSO and one parameter from your gradient descent algorithm, which is the learning rate anyway. Okay, so if you look at the numerator, you can see it's minus C1 R1 plus C2 R2. The C1, C2, R1, R2 are the parameters of your particle swarm optimization algorithm, right? And the denominator nu, which is the learning rate, denominator nu is a learning rate, is a learning rate that you can either set as a fixed learning rate or there are other ways to set these learning rates as well. Okay, all right. And eventually what turns out is that the the, the new it turns out to be one minus beta, which is even good. So that means the learning rate can be expressed in terms of the another parameter of our version of the PSO, which is beta, right? So this is one theorem. And then there are a bunch of other theorems as well. Okay. All of these theorems, what they have done for us is basically they have they have enabled us to express whether we use a gradient descent algorithm or a stochastic gradient descent algorithm or a stochastic gradient descent with a momentum. Okay. Or in fact, there are some standard optimizers, even optimizers like Ada Delta, Adam, and so on and so forth. We have been able to express the derivative irrespective of whether the loss function is differentiable or non-differentiable. So we have been able to express the derivative in terms of the parameters of the particle swarm optimization. At this point of time, somebody might have a question. Sir, what about the parameters of the particle swarm optimization? Are, is there any tuning required? The answer is no. And that's the amazing part, right? So in one shot, not in one shot, after proving bunch of theorems, for each and every time when we ran experiments on bunch of different data sets. So, so far we have ran our experiments on 19 different data sets. And some of these data sets are real, real nasty, I tell you. Okay. We have not for once needed to change the parameters, values of our particles. We started with C1 plus C2 equal to 4. We started with 50 particles. We started with R1 and R2, a fixed, I mean, the sampled value from an uniform distribution, and that's it. In no particular data set, we had to change. And also the learning rate new, we did not have to change it anywhere. Okay. And for all data sets across, this particular thing beat the state of the art optimizers that are currently used. Some of you might have used Adam, right? I'll show you in a couple of slides later that all of these. Uh, data sets, we actually beat Adam, not only in loss and accuracy, but also the, the time taken to converge to the global minimum. Okay. And this is when we used the differentiable loss functions, mean square error and uh, cross entropy. When we used mean absolute error as a loss function, our results are even more convincing. We are beating Adam and other optimizers hands down, both in terms of time to converge and also in terms of loss and accuracy. And that is precisely because of this equivalence, nothing else, right? So, I mean, you are actually replacing the gradient computation with this approximation and that's it. Okay. So this is a simple example to show how, if I give you any, any function, you can use the derivative. So the, the, the solid line that you see is the function, right? I mean, which you can use a gradient descent or a gradient ascent algorithm. And the dotted line is the approximation that came out of our algorithm. And using this approximation, as you can see, we have been able to find the global minima or the global maxima always. Okay. All right. So instead of computing the gradient. Okay. All right. So I'll just go to the last table and then there are other things as well. I mean, there are a bunch of things actually came out of it, uh, including a high dimensional data and things like that. But uh, you know, uh, you can read the slides and uh, I'll, I'll tell you and our, our approximation algorithm also has an order of eight square accuracy, which is pretty good. It's a quadratic order, which is pretty good. Okay. So I will just not show you these results. I just wanted to show you one result, which is that when we have applied our method on the benchmark classification data set, some of these you are familiar with iRail, Sinosphere, Wisconsin breast cancer, Sonar, wheat seeds, 
uh, you know, heart disease, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I have just shown you one sample. We have a lot of other data sets, including MNIST, Fashion MNIST, Cypher 10 and Cypher 100, which are computer vision data sets, notoriously hard to train, right? And you can see almost always, we are either matching Adam and the other state of the art optimizers and sometimes beating them. But this is on a differentiable loss function. The moment we use a non-differentiable loss function, we are way ahead of this. Okay. All right. And this is on the computer vision data sets, as you can see. Okay. So both in terms of training accuracy, testing accuracy, and execution time, we are beating the state of the art optimizers. Okay. All right. Of course, I mean, you can use this same algorithm to solve a bunch of other problems, but I'm really not interested to talk about those. That, that includes traveling salesman problem and other, other sort of problems. But the, the idea is this, that irrespective of your loss function being differentiable or non-differentiable, instead of computing the derivative or the gradient, use this approximation of ours, use it in the training in the back propagation of neural network and bingo. Okay, I think 19 data sets, 19 data sets is a good enough, uh, you know, empirical validation of our method. Okay, I mean, so, I mean, I would stop here, uh, but I just wanted to show you some uh, literature survey. And uh, if you want to read the paper, the free PDF is hosted on ResearchGate, right? And the codes are hosted on the GitHub. Okay, all right. And so at the end of the slide, is my opinion about particle swarm optimization any better than it was two years back? The answer is yes. Okay, all right. I, I think it's an excellent algorithm. Um, and there are lots of other treasures that are hidden inside this algorithm that we haven't been able to figure out yet. But I hope, if not me, somebody else will. Okay, so thank you very much. And I will put on, put back the, um, I think I'll just, I'll be back on screen and I'll just take your questions if there are any. Um, uh, yes, there is one question. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one question from uh, um, Anirudh. Anirudh is our student in his, he has actually asked this question. So I'll read out uh, the question to you. Okay. Uh, he needs a, he needs a little clarity here. What he's saying is, we use gradient descent algorithm to update weights such mm -hmm. that the loss loss is minimal. Yeah, that's true. But certain problems uh, does not support differentiation. I think you spoke about it. So mm -hmm. to speak, uh, uh, so to solve that problem, ADA swarm is used where no differentiation is involved. Now, now he's continuing. So in this case, the weights are updated based on the optimization it has found in each epoch. I mean, he wants some clarity here. The weights are uh, updated based on the optimization it has found in each epoch. Right, right. But but it is not it is not actually epoch wise because yeah. I mean, you uh, if you if you read the equivalence theorems that we have proved, I mean, there is a direct equivalence between the weights that you are you are you are going to use in your uh, neural network and the parameters of the particle swarm. So even the weights are being replaced by the parameters of the particle swarm optimization. Okay, so it's sort of, it's 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 more or less like, a, it's, more, it's, it's more or less like a one-shot approximation. Okay, which you, are, you continue to use in each epoch. So there isn't much, so each and every time you change the weights, right? I mean, you can you can change the weights, right? So you are, you are changing the weights exactly in the same way. Weight update, Wn plus one equal to Wn minus the learning rate times the error gradient, right? All you are doing is that you are replacing that error gradient with the parameters of the PSO. Not, not the classical PSO, but parameters of the PSO that we proposed. So you are updating the weights, yes. But while updating the weights, you are not using the error gradient. <laughs> you would not realize this problem if you continue to use mean square error and cross entropy in your training, right? I mean, you will realize this problem when you use mean absolute error as a loss function or, um, you know, quantile loss or check loss or all other kind of loss functions. Okay, and interestingly enough, there is no regularization that is required here, not yet. Okay, so you're updating the weights, yes. 
it's the same weight update but you are not computing the thousands and thousands of error gradients that you have to otherwise compute you are replacing all of that with that you know parameters of the ps and probably we are using the momentum so that is also giving the right direction so that it uh, reaches to the global optima is that how Sorry. things are linked momentum of the pso you mean momentum of the pso yes yes, yes. no but, but you don't when you when you look at the approximation between the gradient and uh, the pso parameters you don't see the momentum term but implicitly yes that's exactly what it is doing okay mm -hmm. there is something which is uh, which is called a nestor of uh, momentum which is uh, used these days on in uh, when the neural networks are uh, trained and i mean mm -hmm. I, i'm not very not, not not very familiar never worked on it but uh, looks like it also serves the same purpose i mean when it is connected with uh, neural no, networks it, it, it would doesn't. be no, no it doesn't the, re the, the okay. reason why, why it doesn't is because it is still using the same gradient descent and gradient ascent updates right it is computing it is computing the error gradients so the our whole idea is to absolve you of the burden of computing the error gradients okay you just you just replace it with that equivalence relation yeah i think i'll take a look at it once again but it it doesn't seem to be doing the uh, computation of the error gradient in nestor of maybe i'll take a look at it once again not very familiar never worked on it um, it doesn't doesn't seem to be doing that but yeah let, let i'll just explore more on this i mean i don't know i mean he could be doing a momentum but but once again also like he i mean that uh, nestor has not applied this to non differentiable loss functions nobody does actually nobody actually works on nobody uses non differentiable loss functions in neural network training people, people you you know that very well that people use yeah, yeah. mean square error or cross intro yeah pretty much for the reason that the gradient becomes zero so there is no update so yeah correct that's right right okay any other questions yeah uh, sir this is akshay bulbule uh, uh -huh. uh, session was uh, very informative uh, thank you for that uh, i have a question it might be a very basic one it might not mm -hmm. be directly related to the topic that you spoke also uh, the question mm -hmm. is any any ml algorithm for that matter you know is mm -hmm. there a trade off between you know predictive accuracy interpretability or explainability and computational com complexity so with mm -hmm. pso uh, i think you mentioned that accuracy is great and also the computational com uh, it is not computationally inexpensive i just wanted to it understand is, it is computationally inexpensive yeah right so far but not the not the not the uh, vanilla version of the pso okay our our version of the pso okay and also please please note that when i say computationally inexpensive i say that in the context of neural network training okay not not in the context of anything else i mean it may not be inexpensive when you try to solve a traveling salesman problem using this it may not be inexpensive when you try to solve a multivariate multi objective optimization problem using this mm -hmm. okay it is only in the context of neural network training because you are actually using an approximation of the error gradients okay okay because when you are comparing your method when you are comparing our method you are comparing our method with the state of the art optimizers which are used in neural networks and all of these are gradient based okay okay, okay. sure sir yeah. so so what happens with explainability i think you were mentioning that uh, about explainability also so if you can throw some light on that should should that be compromised explainability uh, explainability in terms of what because if you look at deep learning algorithms most of the yeah. deep learning algorithms Correct. are not explainable at all right right okay. here at least the explainability comes from i can say explainable because i have actually proved theorems unlike yeah. most deep learning literature where no reason is given as to why this particular algorithm has worked or why this particular yeah. algorithm has not worked here the reason why this algorithm has worked is because you are able to approximate all the error gradients in terms of the parameters of the particle sum optimization right okay. so you are not your gradient computation itself has become one shot instead of many shot okay okay so that's that's the explainable part sure sir thanks a lot sir thank you
Any other question? Okay, before we end the session, uh, I want to notify all the participants that uh, we have sent, uh, I have uh, just typed a link wherein you have to give a feedback uh, through which your certificate for this today's uh, session will be uh, generated. So please enter the details properly. Uh, the first thing is you need to just enter your title. Next one is the name. Please make it make sure that it's your title, like Mr., Miss, Mrs., or Doctor, and then the name in capitals. Thank you. Any other questions? Sir, the link is not working. No, the link. The link. One second, sir. I'll just, I'll just check. It. Sir, I'm not able to see the link, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the link may not work from my slides, but I think Professor Madhu can send you the link. Um, I'll just send the link in the chat box. Any other questions? Sir, I don't think there's any other questions. Sir. Okay, Thank fine. you so much. Thank you so much sir, you. For, for your precious Thank time. You. In your busy schedule, you have come and given us this uh, talk and uh, delivered a talk to us. Uh, thank you so much uh, from the department of uh, ISC, uh, Nite Minakshi. I really thank you for uh, being the special guest for today and uh, giving us an insight about uh, the the uh, in search of super optimizer, the uh, algorithm and that stuff. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank, thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Yes, sir. Madhu sir, link is not working. So the link is here, sir, in the chat box. It is working. Uh, is anybody else not able to click on the link? If it's not working, please let me know. Because I just checked, sir, it is working. In the chat. Yes, sir. It is showing redirecting. It's, uh... it's working, sir. It's working, sir, uh, because uh, I can see the certificates have been generated. Uh, looks like link is working for few. Yeah, no, ma'am, it's working because I can see all of them, uh, all of yeah. the certificates here. Please copy the link in your browser. It, it has to work because I have checked it again. The link is working. Others are able to generate the certificate. Others are able to give you give the feedback as well. You can copy you can uh, copy paste in the browser. If not working on the same browser, you can use the incognito window. It should be able to deliver. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Jayashree. Uh, yeah, I'll be able. I'll be sending the PPT later. All those. Uh, I think. Uh, I think, Madhu sir, we will stick to the same for uh, format that whenever there is a request from the participant about the PPTs yes, yes, or the reports, I'll be sending the yes, PPTs. So if, yeah. yeah, if there is a request that okay. comes from the participant, the yeah. participant will be given. It is. Uh, it's. It will be like this. Thank if, you, sir. Uh, if you guys need, you can please send a mail to events.isc at nmit.ac.in. This is the email ID. Those who require those, this resource of the PPT, uh, of the resource person, BPT, you can send me a mail to this email ID. I'll be reverting back, replying back with the result, uh, with the PPTs. 
any other issue or any other concerns okay thank you all for attending the session uh, i'll be again sharing uh, the session 3 of our webinar which will be held on 10th that is uh, day after tomorrow uh, by mr pavan thada uh, who is a data scientist in unisys so uh, i would request you to again register to the same link which you registered earlier uh, only thing is you need to say, uh, opt, opt opt out the uh, session 3 or I think session six, because earlier uh, pa Mr. Pavan had uh, supposed to give the session on 22nd, but because of some uh, technical issues, uh, uh, Mr. Pavan Thada uh, session will be pre on 10th. And uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Soma's presentation or the uh, session delivery will be done on 22nd. So there's a small change. Uh, those who want to register please use the same registration link which was sent earlier and a mail will be sent to you later regarding the uh, google meet uh, link thank you so much i hope everybody has entered the the feedback form if any issue uh, please Sir? yeah yeah ma'am if we've already registered for all the webinars that you have sent are we supposed to re-register again no 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 if you've already re uh, registered see the uh, the google form only takes one session registration at a time so i Absolutely. think yeah i think you have done it multiple times so if you've already done yes, sir. there's no need to do it again okay for those who have not done and who have only attended today's session i'm i'm uh, informing them that they can again register for the other sessions okay so thank you thank you ma'am thank you for attending the session okay uh, somebody is asked for registration link i'll again send the registration link in this chat itself if you are there you can link uh, use that link just a moment. Um, Manjula, ma'am, uh, you can use this registration link. If you're still here, you can use the registration link and you can register for the other sessions as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.